take this semester? Well, I'm, I'm going to take faith this semester. And then the, there was only one course I ever took that was related to the Bible, and it was called the Bible as Literature. Uh, the whole purpose of that course was try to prove to us that the Bible was not infallibly written and in, in errant. It was not the Word of God. It was just a piece of literature. Just another piece of literature. And so we've got these great institutions that the world admires. You know, the world admires its own. They love their own. Jesus said the world loves their own. Um, <clears throat> they have their uh, great geniuses and the great minds. They never associate great minds coming out of a spiritual context or a church. It's always Harvard and Yale University where you've got these um, bright, great minds. <clears throat> you can... Um, Somebody said relative to science, a, a, a real pure scientist can see the uh, a bug on a barn door, but he don't see the barn. Or you can't see the forest for the trees. <clears throat> So this is the whole purpose of the church in contrast with intellectual groups and, and uh, universities, seminaries. The whole purpose of the church is to bring forth a whole new category of knowledge which is the most important knowledge of all, it turns out. And that's what this lesson's about. Faith makes sense. We walk by faith, not by sight. We, Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight. <clears throat> we, we that are, are in Christ, we that have the hope uh, of God's word, the hope of the kingdom of God, the hope of heaven, the hope of eternal life, the hope of life after death in Christ. We, that is, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. <clears throat> Einstein didn't walk by faith. He, he, he believed it had to be explained by mathematics. The world has to be explained mathematically. Or the, the world has to be explained biologically. Or the life, life or meaning has to be explained through chemistry. <clears throat> but those are physical things. Those are creative things. What about the one behind all that <clears throat> who is invisible, cannot be seen? It doesn't matter what microscope or telescope you're looking through, how minuscule the thing is through a microscope, or how astrologically grand it is looking through a telescope, you're not going to see God because God is invisible. But yet, He's the author of eternal life. He's the only one you can have hope for. Science can do nothing for you. One of these days, a doctor is going to look at Dale and say, we've done all we can for him. He's, he's, he's a goner. They probably won't say it that way. But that's what they mean. <clears throat> so we're just going to keep them under morphine till, till they expire. Then what? Then what? So you spend your life looking through a telescope or a microscope, and, but you're not going to ever see God there. You're going to see the evidence that God was there. Because God spoke and created all that, spoken into existence. <clears throat> but what about when you take your last breath? 
So today's lesson is about faith. Faith is, in our text verse, our King James Bible, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you have another translation? What does those words mean? Substance and evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk not by sight. Keep that in mind. You can't walk and please God and have understanding of all things through sight. It's not what you see with your natural eye. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul said, in speaking of the word of God and the revelation of Almighty God, for eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. I think that's 1 Corinthians 2 and 10, 9 and 10. <clears throat> For eye hath not seen, that is natural eye. Ear hath not heard, that is you, you can't go to the ear doctor and he can't fix you up where you can hear it. I just had cataracts taken off my eye. And uh, it made made what I was seeing a little brighter, but you, they can't give me, the eye doctor can't give me spiritual insight. The ear doctor can't give me uh, insight into God through the operations of the natural physical ear. Neither hath he entered into the natural heart of a man. My heart doctor can't give it to me either. But God hath revealed them unto his spirit. So now we're getting into what this lesson is really about. Faith makes sense. What is faith then? Substance of things hoped for. Evidence of things not seen. Give me some substitute words that may be in other translations. Substance and evidence. What's that mean? Give me Debbie's translation. Well, it's just past date. <laughs> oh, you got date? Okay. It says uh, substance is the groundwork, the support, and the confidence. Yeah. Uh, finest Dake. Um, the ground uh, or the confidence. The substance, faith, is the ground or the confidence of things not seen. Think about that. Faith is the key. Faith is the instrument, the vehicle through which you might know something that could not otherwise be known any other way. Faith teaches you things that natural eye, and your natural rational intellect cannot comprehend. <clears throat> yeah, certainty. Uh, that's uh, ground, certainty, confidence. There's some other words we could use. What? Conviction. That you are you are convicted. You you feel inside of you a knowledge of certainty about what is. There's no way in the world you can get the hope of heaven and of eternal life or anything to prepare you to die out of a science book. Trust, faith is, a synonymous word with faith is trust. 
So how does that happen? Why do some people then have faith and others do not? I mean salvific faith of eternal life. You can't have eternal life without faith. How, did, how does that happen then? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. A what? Desire? <clears throat> well, that, but how does that desire come about? Let's let's get that. The the, the point I want to make is um, it's out here somewhere. Um, how how does a person? Is a person transformed and translated through uh, and given faith or receive faith? Do what? The spirit, the, spirit. the spirit of God. So there is the operation of the Spirit of God that gives testimony and bears record. Of course, he's invisible because he's God. And uh, uh, you can look through telescopes and, and uh, microscopes and you can't see the Holy Spirit. So, but he's operating. And he, what's he saying? He's, he's uh, appealing, the Bible says, to every man's conscience. The Holy Spirit is universal everywhere, all the time. Always has been, eternal never goes away, cannot die, will never cease to exist. That's the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> All the great minds that's ever lived just lived their allotted days and died. And usually uh, their great mind, of course, and the record they left died with them. I mean, what, what did Einstein give you? Did Einstein give anyone the hope of heaven or his eternal life looking out into the astrophysical universe? The ability to split an atom and create the atomic bomb. I, I get so tired. I used to. I don't anymore. I'm too old and don't care. But all these, uh, all this talk of great minds everywhere you go to the university, uh, and especially if you happen to be able to be taught by one of the great professors or the great eggheads of your time, and uh, whose brain somehow or another, our, our brains are 1,500 cc's and his was 1,510 cc's maybe. But you got this great mind <laughs> One professor was talking, he, he was serious uh, about this professor, and he said his head was larger, and which gave him more of a capacity for a brain. Usually, if you just got a, a head that just keeps on going, it's just something that's ugly instead of bright. Uh, but that's the way they think about great minds, but the, the Bible teaches us, and uh, I want to get into that, part of faith is, its object is the Bible. Not only God, but the record that God gave. The Bible is the record that God gave in Christ through the inspiration of prophets and apostles. This is the book. And <clears throat> this book, for someone who uh, has faith, not only faith in God, but faith in the record that God left 
his own testimony. This is the testimony of God. You got any other books with you? That's the testimony of the mind of some man. This is the testimony that was given to us by God. This is the autobiography of God. This tells you all about the truth of God. It's, there's no book like it. And I noticed John, more than anyone else, I guess, probably more than even the Apostle Paul, he, uh, he stresses the written. Let's look at that. Opening of the book of Revelation, 1, 1 and 2 and 3, I think it is. <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Very testimony and revelation of God. Who bear record, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, readeth. Not only blessed is the one that's writing it, but blessed is the one that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things, how you do that? By faith. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And he says, uh, you know, John wrote five books, and his five books are more, are, contain more words than Paul's 13 books. So John is the most prolific writer in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles, and the book of Revelation. And he has a whole lot to say about things just like that. If you'll turn to John chapter um, 5 in the Gospel, Gospel of John chapter 5. Jesus is dialoguing with the Jews as his manner was and his the way he taught. And he's talking about who he is and his witness, and who the Father is, and he, that he had come to reveal them. And then he gets to verse 39, and he says this, <clears throat> Search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He's talking about the Old Testament here. Uh, which, that's the scriptures they had. There was no written New Testament yet. So he said, sir, go back. You claim, you Jews, you believe uh, in the Bible. You got the Old Testament. Well, go search them. For that Bible that you have is is the Bible that testifies of me. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. That, the Jews believe that. They clung to the Bible, the law of God. And, but Jesus said, but you're missing it. Your Bible is, speaks of me. And they, that which, and, and they are they which testify the scriptures testify of me. That is the record of me. Then look on down in verse 44 through 47. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Nobody was bigger to the Jews than Moses. But 
the great lawgiver. For had you believed Moses, if you really do believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So it's faith, faith in the very words of God. And you have to believe then, it's finally, that this book is a gift of God. And that you cannot make your way through life and know anything really uh, without this book. Well, this is the crux of the matter. I brought with me t today uh, the Thomas Jefferson Bible. This is it, the Jefferson Bible. And um, <clears throat> he was our third president, the most philosophical, probably, president we ever had. One of the most, you know, he's the author of the Declaration of Independence, founder of our nation in that sense, instrumental in all of it, involved in, in knowledge, all branches of knowledge. But he was a rationalist as well as a deist. What is this uh, category of knowledge called rationalism? And all the great philosophers, mo most of them were rationalists. That um, you could discover the truth not by faith, but by your ability to reason. You could just go through a series of intellectual deductions and um, break down or inductions building up from the standpoint of your brain or your mind, your, your ability to rationalize, and that you could come up with uh, the truth. And that's, that's the general idea that's growing today. Um, that if you can't discover God by reason, in contrast to by faith, for, you know, by faith are you saved through grace. By faith are you saved. By grace are you saved through faith. And you can't be saved through intellectual constructions, through reasoning. You can't come up with the truth through reasoning because you're finite, because I'm finite. You're not God. So you can't come up with the truth through reason. Now, this does not mean that reason's not important, it's not a category of man makeup uh, a man is a reasonable being and faith is never con contradictory to reason faith transcends reason at points it reaches up and goes places where you can't go <clears throat> reminds me of this lady on the Andy Griffith show she was hypochondriac and uh, she always explained when she was around Andy how her arthritis hurt her and it would go up and around her shoulders and in her neck and in her head and down the other side of her and he said Emma I will tell you that when you get a pain it really goes places So I want to tell you about the absolute arrogance of Thomas Jefferson as typical of rationalists. Absolute uh, arrogance. That he thought, he thought that he could tell you what part of the Bible was from God and what part wasn't. And so he wrote his own Bible. You can get these in a bookstore if you'd like to read them. 
And he was a redactionist. He believed that we don't, the Bible was not given to us as a gift, that the Bible that you have was not a gift from God. It was, for the most part, put together by men, and it's men's ideas. And <clears throat> he decided he knew what was man's idea and what was God's idea. And the whole world is doing that now. You can count on this. The last battle for our faith and to be saved as we go forward into this world, deeper in, into 2023 and whatever else God has for us in time, that they're going to be farther and farther away from the Bible and more and more and more into science and the human capability of discovering truth without God. So that's the kind of unbelief that's working now in the world today. <clears throat> and we are looked upon by them as just Bible thumpers, and they come up with slang words and ideas like that uh, to demean your faith in believing in God as it's revealed in the Bible, his word. And there's going to be less and less hope and faith in that as we move forward. So you're going to become more and more of a small minority. So you're going to have to have something, back to the scripture, this substance and evidence, this conviction, this ground of truth within you that's supernatural. Something that's more profound and dynamic that anchors your soul so that you, as Paul said in one place, become unmovable. That as this one lady didn't know how to explain herself any better when the professor asked her, you know, you based that on what? She said, I just know that I 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 know, that I know, that I know, that I know. It's an inner revelation of God in the spirit of man so that you know. And that's what Jesus says. And this is the work of God <clears throat> in um, uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5 of John. Excuse me, chapter 6. Move on to the next chapter. John chapter 6. And uh, <clears throat> this is Jesus talking to the Jews, still talking to them. Jesus said unto them, verily, uh, verse 32, Verily I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread. You know, they said, Moses, uh, go a little bit earlier than that. Uh, let's, let's go to verse, um, let's start with verse 25. And this helps us get the picture and the meaning of it. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, you seek, <coughs> you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and, and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth, or the, food, the word food there, but the food which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom God has sent. This is the work of God, that you believe. What's that mean? It means this. How long have you been saved, Bill? Long time. <laughs> Somehow, 
the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was working with Bill for a long time before he got saved. And the Holy Spirit was saying to him the whole time, way back, I don't know if he was a teenager or a child or later on, but the whole time the Holy Spirit was working just like he was with me, trying to bring us to the knowledge and the revelation of God. And, uh, you know, he just kept working that way, kept working with you. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom God has sent. And the Holy Spirit the whole time was corresponding with the teachings of Jesus and his spirit, saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And this is the work of God, the Holy Spirit working, saying to believe in God. And how, how is that? He's invisible working on your spirit, which is invisible. It's, a, it's a, all a supernatural, invisible operation of Almighty God. You can't get saved. You can't find God in a book written by man. You have to believe the testimony that God has given of himself. And this is the testimony of God, that you believe on him whom God has sent. Now, rationalists despise that idea. They want to think that you have the ability to figure out God and that you ought to be uh, applauded. Somebody ought to stand up and give you an out, uh, a standing ovation because you say that you have figured out God and you believe. But it's the gift of God. It comes from God. You didn't have anything to do with it except within you, you yield it over finally somewhere in a mysterious way. Somehow God touched your heart and what happened in there, somewhere along the line, if you're a believer today, it happened to you just like it happened to me, just like it happened to Brother Steele or whomever else is here today and millions of others. What happened in that moment when the Spirit of God had been dealing with you and your spirit all along saying, believe, trust God, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father has a son, him God has sent into the world, crucified, resurrected on the third day, that you might be saved. Somehow or another, that testimony from God took root in you, and in a moment, you were transformed by the power of God, and you believed. And by believing, you were saved at that moment, regenerated, became a new creature in Jesus Christ at that moment. How? It was all a dynamic spiritual operation uh, administered by the Holy Ghost. And it's called, in simple terms, being born again. It's not a, just an intellectual uh, apprehension. It's not an intellectual ascent. Uh, it's not something that you do just out of your brain. Well, two and two is four, therefore this and that. There must be God out there, and I'll say I believe on him. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's a, a trust factor. You're converted in your spirit. You're turned over to the revelation of God. And now you know God. And God knows you. And you have an intimate, at that point, an intimate relationship with God. That's called being born again. That's called the new birth. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. A new creation. I mean, you're a different person when that happens. You're now a believer. You're now in Christ. He's the firstborn of every creature. He's a, that is, he's the firstborn of everyone that's born again. Jesus is the firstborn. That, that term is used five times about Jesus. The firstborn. Firstborn. He's the firstborn since Adam 
born without sin. Every man that comes into the world born in sin. He was the firstborn not born in sin. And then, so, you become born again of His seed. He's the firstborn. You're born again afterwards. And He's creating a new human race of born again people. That's what this is all about. He came to create a whole new race of born again people. And who's going to be raptured? Born again people. Hallelujah. And you can be a part of a whole ecumenical movement, a world council church movement, which is all going to be destroyed and lost. It's depicted there in Revelation chapter 17. It's, it's a prostitute system of the gospel. But uh, born again, and this is the work of God. Verse 29 that you believe on him whom God hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then? <laughs> the Jews, Jesus said the Jews are evil because they seek a sign. What did he say in another place? And no sign shall be given him except the sign of Jonas the prophet. What was sign was that? He was raised on the third day. He was delivered on the third day. And as he was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of God shall be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. And that's the sign. Believe on a resurrected... How many believe Jesus was resurrected on the third day? How many feel his presence here this morning because he was raised from the dead? How many believe not only that he's here, but he's sitting on the right hand of God in a throne on high? Hallelujah. That same Jesus. That same Jesus. That's what makes a person a believer. Uh, so our fathers did eat manna. What sign will you give us then? That we may see. <laughs> look, look what they said. What sign will you give us that we may see and believe? They must have all been from Missouri. Seeing is believing. What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat man in the desert, and it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay, what are you going to give us? Verily I say unto you, Moses gave you not bread from heaven. But my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Look, what he's saying is, you're looking at me right now. But that's not, that's not, that won't save you. Looking at the fleshly Jesus. But he goes back, it has to be a revelation from the Father that you know I'm his son. And faith, title of this lesson, faith makes sense. Faith makes sense. I'm accepting that title on the basis of what we're talking about. Faith is not sensical, but it's, it's, uh, it makes sense. That is, it agrees with your reasoning. And so, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. <clears throat> Hold on just a minute. 
It's over. Have a good day.